free fall. The only sense that the man had when he was loaded onto the helicopter was his touch, feeling the cool air assaulting his freshly battered skin. Perhaps it was the ending spring air, that always had a little nip of coolness that signified its end, or maybe it was the beginning summer air, coupled with the air picking up the cold ocean current along the coast. He didn't know how long he was there, so he couldn't be certain of the true season, just certain of the fact that this was his last season. Before the ride, he was stripped down to his undergarments, a humiliating ordeal that the guards took great pleasure in, blindfolded, gagged, and deaf end by earmuffs, hearing only the slight whirl of the helicopter blades. Now, sitting on the floor of the cabin, he remained like a statue, being unable to ascertain his true surroundings, who was around him, what they were saying, if they even felt a tinge of remorse for their actions. As he felt the helicopter begin to ascend, it brought the man back to a similar time of hopelessness, on the farm. Growing up, the man lived on a farm not owned by his parents, but rather the head of a foreign fruit company that laid their claim on his land with the help of the regime. They, along with the rest of the workers, lived in measly shacks on the outskirts of the property, exposed to the elements throughout the year with the poor design and materials of their homes. In their hobble, lay the man, his parents, and his younger brother. Every day was the same, with them toiling away at the fields, at the expense of their lifespans, with people keeling over on a regular basis, only to be immediately replaced. The man had eventually grown to at least tolerate his conditions, being at the servitude of this unknown giant that controlled them all, but his brother, he couldn't handle it as well, it could have been the lesser years of work he had compared to the man, but either way, he didn't possess what everyone else had. Instead, he possessed something far greater. From an early age, the brother showed signs of high intelligence, teaching himself how to read and examine books that were snuck from the owner's house by age eight. Being the only literate family member, he led his family and eventually other households through Bible studies, being the only thing that some families owned. The family's combined salary was miserable, however, whatever they could save went to the brother's education. Everyone knew that the brother had to take advantage of this, including the man, who personally pushed his brother to be the best he could be. Eventually, the family was able to put the brother through school with what little they had. While in school later than most, the brother's intellect allowed him to skip several grades, and soon, graduated into high school, and a few years after that, was on his way to the college. Everyone cheered for the brother when he got accepted. He hoped to complete college and finally go to law school, in hopes of becoming a lawyer that could change the very system that had to endure for decades. By this point he had won numerous scholarships, and was able to send some money back to the family. Now with one son gone, the parents turned to the man. They knew he was good with his hands, so he began working for the local mechanic, gaining a reputation for his honest work ethic. This helped when, one day, a young woman about his age entered the garage for a broken headlight, after a large bird had flown into it while driving. After repairing the light, and talking with her for almost an hour, the man mustered up the courage to ask her on a date, to which she agreed. Four years later, the two had wed, and soon after, had a baby girl. Since then, even up to that day, he thanked the birds for bringing him such a wonderful person to love. During this span of time, the brother had also made a name for himself, but rather a nationwide name. He quickly went through college and law school and made a career against corrupt government officials, even going as far as the inner circle of the head of state, getting many thanks from the head himself. After a few more major cases, he soon turned his eyes to politics, running for his home district in the legislative assembly, and winning with a wide majority of votes. Now, both boys had brought the family great pride and joy, with one carrying on the legacy, and the other hopefully shaping their very nation. For two years, it is how it remained, until one day, the brother visited the man at work. The man, by this point, owned the garage, as the old owner passed away a few weeks prior. 
the brother asked the man if he had heard of the recent attacks on some military barracks, which he did. He thought perhaps the brother was building a case against them, maybe taking it to the Supreme Court. Then the brother asked him to meet at a certain address that night, which he agreed to, despite the odd request. It took him to an old tavern in the middle of the capital, where in its basement, he met what he called the club, because that's all that it was, and it's all he thought of it as. These men, crowded in the basement, were united together for the one goal of changing the state. It was full of the brothers' fellow politicians, who had seen just how far changing attitudes and laws of the government can get someone in changing one state, and were now using brute force to meet their democratic quota. These men were the ones behind the recent attacks, and while the man was initially apprehensive of working with who he deemed terrorists, the brother reminded him of all that they went through, of what all their fellow countrymen have gone through under the regime. The change has to happen now, or at least sooner than later, and sometimes people have to take immediate action to see their results. With this, the man was the newest club member. At first, the man remained in his own garage, installing discreet armor plating on some of the politicians' cars, in case they would be needed in the fight for the capital. Eventually, the growing demands and vehicles needed proved too much and too suspicious for the small garage, so some politicians bought a remote garage away from prying government eyes. Here, the man could work on higher-end military vehicles, such as armored trucks with large guns and even cannons installed, vehicles he had only heard of. All the while, he had his best mechanic put in charge of his garage, so as to alleviate some suspicions. One day, the man was called to a weekly club meeting, something he hid from his wife by saying he went out with his mechanic crew for drinks and games, hopefully not making her think of an affair or this, where it was told that the coup would occur three months from that date. Finally, a date was set in stone, and everyone, including the man, promised to have the necessary resources ready for that date, and the brother, who promised to try and recruit more people to the cause. After the meeting, the brother pulled the man aside and said that if the coup failed on that day, that the man and his family were to meet at the brother's villa on the border, before escaping for a new life, a good life he reassured. These would be his final words to the man. After several minutes of straight travel, with no deviations, the earmuffs were removed from the man's head, and he heard the muffled voices of the pilots, and the heightened whirling of the blades spinning overhead. A familiar voice coming from beside him yelled into the man's ear, so as to be heard over the helicopter, Can you hear me, sir? Not if you can. The man, with the gag still on him, nodded in compliance. Good, because I just got news that they dispatched a squad to the location you said, and they've just arrived. The man stood there, seeing nothing but darkness, and unable to say anything, unable to do anything, just like his unknowing victim. He remained there in shock, not knowing if he should break down or not. Did you hear me, I said there at the place. The man still remained still, processing how he ended up in this situation. Jesus, can you nod for me, let me know I'm not talking to a brick wall again. The man finally hesitated a nod, muffling a small cry of anguish. You trying to say something? I can't tell. The man bowed his head down and silently sobbed, something the voice realized. Yeah, most of you do this sort of thing, at least the ones up here. Cry, pray, hell, even try to attack me. That's why you got the gag on you now. The man continued sobbing, wondering of the fates of his loved ones. You know, people like you come and go, trying to disrupt the order of things, and where does it get you? Right here. You people need to realize that. No wonder you're all so easy to capture. It was here, up to his final moments, he again thought back, this time back to the end of it all. After the meeting adjourned, the man returned home to his wife and daughter. After asking where he was again, and getting the same reply, they all sat down together and watched a movie, with his daughter clutching her brown teddy bear in her small arms. After the movie, and his daughter had gone to bed, 
he and his wife had gotten into an argument. I called the garage today, asking when I could see you to bring some lunch. You know what they said? They said you haven't been there in weeks. And and on top of this, you're sneaking around, saying you're with the other mechanics, but I called around too, and guess what, you aren't anywhere with the others. What am I supposed to make of this, his wife asked. I can explain this, just not yet, okay. I promise I will the man replied. You promise? What am I supposed to make of this? What's so important that you can't tell me? Honey, I want to, but what this is, is bigger than us, I can't say anything. Why not, I am your wife for heaven's sake. We never keep secrets from each other. This is not me trying to keep secrets. This is me trying to protect you, to protect us. I am helping to change everything, for all of us. Well, unless you tell me exactly what's happening, you're staying on the couch, and you can't tell me then, then you're leaving. His wife then left in a huff, leaving him in the dark living room with just his thoughts. He walked out onto his front yard, and lit a cigarette. How was he going to tell them that he's a part of an anti-government movement, would they understand? As of now, he's just been the mechanic, but come D-Day, and he could very well become a killer, something he figured might happen, but even then against the regime, he would regret. How would his family see him afterward? A monster? A hero? It was all too much for him, and he almost puked on the lawn, until he saw a black car slowly come around the turn towards him. It crawled along down the road, towards his house. He never thought anything of it, it was dark, and this was a crowded neighborhood. So, he composed himself and gave a friendly wave to the driver. This caused the car to stop. Maybe they thought he was telling them to stop, the man thought. So he walked over to them to tell them it was alright, and that's when all the doors opened. Men in suits sprang out, one with a burlap sack in his hand, and rushed the man. They gave him a series of punches, some to the face, and a lot to the gut, before putting the sack over his head and dragging him to the car. Some house lights began to turn on to search for the commotion, but by that time, the man was already shoved in the back seat and the car had sped away. Who are you? the man asked, recovering from the hits. People looking to ask you questions one of the suited men replied, as the man frantically collected his thoughts, not being able to see where he was going, only feeling a turn in the road every so often. Eventually, it came to a quick stop, with the man hitting his head on the console, erupting the car in laughter. It's a wonder his head never rang like a bell, one of the back passengers boomed, opening the door and dragging the man out. The man could hear the distant sounds of birds chirping, singing their songs of freedom as they flew together in harmony. If only he could be one of them, the man thought, being led into a building. Walking through its halls, he could hear the sounds of loud hits being landed, and the wails of agony echoing through. This would soon be him, but he had to remain strong. Even when they led him into a room, handcuffed him to a chair, and removed his hood, he still held fast, with a stoic look upon his face, almost challenging his oppressors. They looked at his expression, and each cracked a smile. They knew that eventually, no matter how long it took, they would break him, and get whatever they needed from him. With that, they left him in that room, for an hour, until the inspector believed the ordeal could properly begin. The man screamed hard for that hour, wondering when it would begin. After a while, he began wishing for it, not so much as to feel the pain, but to just get it over with. He wondered if they would kill him afterwards, or dump him at his house. Maybe they had other club members in the other rooms, or maybe even his family. This terrified him, and his screaming eventually turned to almost begging, begging that they would harm him, and not them. He would never know, all he knows now is the haunting fluorescent lights overhead and the threat of his own demise. Finally, the suits heard his anguished cries, and called the inspector to the room to begin the interrogation. 
Entering the room before the man was the inspector, a towering, slender man that had to duck under the doorway to enter. Comfortable today, sir, the inspector asked, hanging up his suit and hat on a nearby rack. The man looked at the tall figure looming before him, speechless. Sir? Gonna answer my question, the inspector said. Go to hell the man replied, after a moment of silence, to compose his thoughts. The inspector chuckled, ah, haven't had a fighter in a while. Most of you people don't have a backbone after all. Does this mean that others have talked, thought the man, because if so, he wasn't going to be the one to do so. You see, the inspector replied, sitting down at the chair across from the man, everyone else has talked. We know where everyone else is, at least, everyone except Brother Dearest. You do know where I'm going with this right? I'm not telling you anything, you bastard the man replied, gritting his teeth. Oh, I knew you'd be special. Finally some fun for today. The inspector boomed back, getting up from his chair and walking to the coat rack, and drawing two studded gloves from his coat pocket. I haven't been able to use these all day, it's like reuniting with an old friend. I told you I'm not talking, this is pointless the man yelled out, as the inspector slipped on the gloves and walked over to the man, who began to fear what was coming. If so, there is still a reason to try. For our security. You understand that the inspector answered, throwing a right hook into the man's cheek, leaving lacerations and loosening some teeth. He had no time to compose himself, as the inspector landed blow after blow on his face and abdomen. All he could do was wince in pain each time, trying to still show at least some semblance of authority in this situation. The inspector ceased the punching, and crouched down to the man's level, your brother made quite a name for himself, he got himself quite a few properties. I'm sure one of them is a safe house, and I'm sure he told you which one it was. In between his short breaths, the man breathed, go to hell. He was ready now for the next series of blows. Instead, the inspector got up, and said to him with a calm demeanor, removing his gloves, you will tell us, we have our ways of opening people up. And I know what'll open you up. He walked over to the rack, put the gloves back in his pockets, and put back on his coat, before momentarily leaving the room. What is he talking about, the man thought. At one club meeting, one of the politicians talked about the different kinds of torture that these people, the secret police would put you through. From beatings to waterboarding, they did it all. So the man was left to wonder what monstrous device would be used against him. It was therefore a great shock then, when all the inspector brought in was a teddy bear. It was his daughter's brown teddy bear. How did you get that? The man frantically asked, his eyes widening. We have our ways sir. You should know that by now the inspector replied, throwing the bear onto the man's lap, making him thrash around in anger, trying to loosen his restraints. What have you bastards done? The man screamed out, as the handcuffs began to cut into his wrists, and the bear fell from his lap. Nothing yet, but that can change, unless you tell me something good the inspector replied, bending down face to face with the man, who by now was in tears. Just a few hours prior, everything was going according to plan, and now what? What was his family thinking of him now? What is happening to them now? They have to be here, the bear has a stain that the girl gave to it when she was younger. It was all too much, and he put his head down, and sobbed. The time for sorrow has sailed long ago, so it's best you tell me something now, or else. The man jolted his head up, yelling, please, no. Don't hurt them, please. Tell me something so I won't have to the inspector answered, watching the man take a few deep breaths. He he's probably at his villa on the border the man finally replied. Probably, the inspector inquired. Please. It's a place he told me to meet him if things went south. So definitely. Yes yes definitely, okay. Please just don't hurt them the man sobbed, again lowering his head. 
The inspector smiled and picked the bear up, you've just done this nation a great service, and it thanks you before leaving the room, assumedly to get people to go to the villa. He left the man in that interrogation room for a half hour, leaving him alone with his guilty conscience. He was still sobbing when two men came in to take him for processing. At club meetings, the politicians there discussed this. They had heard from rumors that after interrogations, they would process people by stripping them almost naked, and deprive them of their senses by blindfolding, gagging, and placing earmuffs on the individual, to make them feel subhuman. From there, they would be summarily executed, but that is where some sources differed. One spoke of a basic firing squad, while another spoke of a gas chamber, and there was even talk of death flights, where they would take people in helicopters and ditch them overseas. This was best used to explain the lack of evidence, but it was mostly just hearsay. As the man was loaded onto the helicopter, however, he realized it was anything but. Approaching the drop zone a pilot over the intercom boomed out. Your final encore is approaching sir, the inspector yelled, taking the man's blindfold off. The sudden brightness made the man wince, but the dark colors of the helicopter interior soon made it easy to focus. Here he was, once again, with the inspector, and looking outside, he saw nothing but an endless floor of ocean hundreds of feet below. We're a ways up, aren't we? Most people have this reaction too. It's like watching the life leave their eyes the inspector boomed. The man began hyperventilating through his nose, something the inspector could notice, but all he did was chuckle. You know, you showed me a good time. I don't get to do these often, but when I do, I make sure I get the special ones. So thanks for that the inspector spoke, as he pressed a button by the side of the cabin door, opening it up, making the cold air whip around the interior of the helicopter. Sadly, this is where we must depart. Again, thank you for your service, sir the inspector said, gripping a handle on the ceiling, and kicking the man out of the plane, without a moment's hesitation, or a moment for the man to collect his thoughts. Here he is now, free falling through the air, about to hit the water at a speed he can't even comprehend for his life. All he wanted was a better tomorrow, for him and his family, a chance at something new. Now, he won't even have a tomorrow. The regime has robbed him of everything, his hopes, dreams, his life, and his tomorrow. His and many others' tomorrows, for the crime of trying to live a good life. He thought back to when he met his wife. His wife robbed that bird of its life, but thanks to that, they had a good life together. A sacrifice for the greater good. Is this how the government would view him? His brother? The countless others who died fighting for what was right? Would they view them as nothing but a bird dead from an accident? At the very least, that was an accident, what they are doing is nothing short of evil, and now, the man would have to spend his final moments praying that everything somehow works out for whoever is left. As a flock of birds flew by his soon-to-be corpse, he began wondering not just about those left, but about heaven himself. He was told, like many before, that you meet long-gone loved ones in heaven, and they greet you at the pearly gates. Up to that point, he was unsure of heaven's existence, but now, he prayed for everything, from salvation, to forgiveness of any of his life's transgressions. Even in his final moments, seconds before he splattered onto the ocean, he was praying above all else, for the hope that when he got to heaven, he wouldn't see his family there. Not yet. He is just one of many, hundreds in fact, who litter the ocean floor. He is in a place where only the dead know. Even decades after, with the trials and searches that would follow, only a few would turn up, leaving the many left out there at the mercy of the ocean, and with their final chance of peace from their unfortunate demise. It is these people who have disappeared, and many more like them all across the globe, who are gone but most certainly not forgotten. For it is in their memory that mankind must strive to not just do better, but to be better, better than what we were yesterday, to strive for something greater. It is in their memory that we shall strive for a better tomorrow.